as I said earlier, my name is Joshua, and I'm going to be preaching on the text that was just read. If you would like a Bible, if that would help you during the sermon, uh, we have some Bibles available at the tables near the exits. There's some on the back um, counter over there. Feel free to get up and grab one of those. And I also have to say, I'm a little under the weather, so I got to grab some water. Um, Later on during communion, I promise that I will be exposed to, uh, none of the elements here will be exposed to my cold. Um, Other people are serving that. I will introduce it uh, and administer it, but you will not get my germs from that. There's never been an outbreak traced to communion. So I've been told. Well, about um, 14 years ago, I did something crazy. I went to the post office and I got my picture taken and um, signed some papers. And a couple of months later, this little blue book showed up in the mail. It was my passport. And um, not long after that, I got on an airplane and I flew across the world to Auckland, New Zealand. And um, at that time in life, I was about 20 years old, <clears throat> had not really traveled ever, grew up in a small town. My world was super small. Um, so, so it was really crazy for me to fly to Auckland, New Zealand and spend a summer working there. And I knew it was going to be different. I knew there were going to be some challenges and some cultural differences. Um, but I was glad that I was going to be living with a family because they would teach me those things. So I rented a room from this great family. We, we quickly became friends. And even though I was a renter, they said, you know, we would love to um, get to know you while you're here. In fact, we would love to have you for tea. Would you like to have tea with us today at about 5 p.m.? And I thought, you know, this is a, this is a British culture, you know, like, that's so British, right? A cup of tea. Would you like to have a cup of tea? And I'm thinking, yes, I'd love that. You know, they're planning a cup of tea. You know, this is awesome. Um, but here's what I didn't know. In New Zealand, tea is their word for dinner. Tea is supper. The last meal of the day, they call tea. So um, they were not inviting me to a cup of tea. They were inviting me to a meal. Um, So I got off work that day at about three in the afternoon, and I thought, I got to get back to their house by five for for tea. So um, I went straight to the pub, and I ordered a giant cheeseburger and um, kumra chips. Kumra is basically New Zealand sweet potato. So sweet potato fries. And because the, you know, the drinking age is 18 there, um, I had a tall imperial pint of Murphy's Stout. And I got done with that meal and I was stuffed. And I looked at my watch and I thought, I've got to get back, I'm gonna be late. So I sprinted out, went to the bus stop, took the bus back, and they lived on the top of a very steep hill. So I'm jogging all the way up this hill, completely covered in sweat. And I you know, swing open the door and I walk in apologizing for being late. And I look at the table and the table is set for a feast. I mean, a feast. There was a, a lace tablecloth on the table. And there was a roast leg of lamb, New Zealand lamb, with mint jelly sauce, roast kumra, and all of the traditional foods of New Zealand. And for dessert, there was this just elaborate um, kiwi fruit and uh, meringue uh, dessert that was the, the national dessert of New Zealand. It was basically like if you prepared a Thanksgiving meal with all the traditional foods, that's what they had prepared for me was this like incredible feast. There was New Zealand wine on the table and they even brought out the crystal. And I was stuffed and sweaty and prepared for a cup of tea. So I did what any 20 year old guy would do. I took one for the team and ate an entire meal. <laughs> um, like it was the, the, you know, the only time I'd ever eaten in my life. Um, And it was amazing. Now, the passage we're looking at today tells us that God is a host. And he's hosting us for a feast. 
And I wonder how many of us look at that feast kind of like I did. We don't really even know that we're being invited to a meal. Um, Maybe we think God's inviting us to just a cup of, of wheat tea and a splash of milk when he's got a feast set before us. Maybe you're even showing up, like I did, stuffed on junk food, on inferior food, and you don't come to the table hungry. Well, this passage says God is hosting a party that's unlike anything we've ever seen before. He's hosting a feast for us, and I think to understand how to come to this feast, to really see um, this feast for what it is, we have to look at the heart of the host. We have to understand what kind of host God is. And so all through this series, we've been looking at, um, one way to say it is we've been looking at the attributes of God. The other way to say it is we've been looking at the heart of God. What is God like? And the challenge for us is to come to God not like we think he is, but to come to him as he says he is, to come to him on his own terms. And so what we're going to see today is the heart of the host, We're going to see that God is a hospitable host, and he's setting a feast for us. And um, and what kind of host is he? We're going to see he is a host that extravagantly lavishes good gifts on his guest. He is the host that eagerly welcomes his guest, and he's the host that entirely defeats the enemies of his guest. So he extravagantly lavishes hospitality on his guest, good gifts. He's setting a feast before his guests. Now, I think for most of us, um, our relationship to feasting is a little bit complicated at best, right? You may think here in America, oh, we, we know how to feast because we know how to consume. We're one of the highest consumers of food on the planet, but did you know that we're, we're, uh, we spend um, less time eating than most countries in the world? So we eat the most food, but we do it in less time. Um, so we're quick eaters, and you can't really feast quickly, can you? Um, I think we know how to get stuffed. I think we know how to consume, but I'm not sure we understand quite how to feast. You know, it's also difficult because there's, there's all of these eco-socio-political aspects of food, right? We wonder, where did my food come from? We wonder, who produced this food? Who brought it to my table? How come the people who produced it can't eat as good as I'm eating right now? Or maybe we think, what, what damage to the earth was done to produce this food? Was it done sustainably? Or maybe you think, you know, I've got a lot of intolerances. And, um, you know, when I moved to Santa Barbara, someone told me it was the land of dietary restrictions. Um, It's a good place to be if you are, you know, uh, if you can't have gluten, if you're vegetarian, if you're lactose intolerant. But, you know, our relationship to feasting is complicated because of those things, because our bodies are broken. We have a complicated relationship to food. Um, or maybe you're like me and you just think, is this going to put weight on me that I don't need? And so every time you show up at the table, you're thinking about your image. You're thinking about how many calories you've consumed that day and how, how many you've burned. Um, and there's a shroud that hangs over all our meals, right? The people we wish were there and who aren't the people we want to be around our table that aren't there for various reasons, or the tables we want to eat at that we we can't eat at those tables. And then as Christians, I think we have another um, complication in our relationship to feasting, because I think sometimes as Christians we think, well, partying is something that the world does. They eat and drink and consume, and we don't want to be gluttons. We don't want to be seeking earthly pleasures. We want to be seeking spiritual pleasures. So what does it mean for the Christian to feast? You know, sometimes I I think, you know, we have a general distrust of parties. Maybe it was the thing you did in high school when you made a lot of bad decisions. Maybe it was the thing you never got invited to in high school and you always wanted to. 
Um, parties sound like something that the world does. And, um, and as Christians, throughout church history, we've, we've elevated the ascetics, haven't we? We've elevated the people who denied worldly pleasures, who denied food, and, and in many times for good reasons. Um, in fact, we think of the spiritual monk who only lives on bread and water, spends his time praying. You know, I heard recently a story of a monk who prayed so much he had calluses on his knees. And um, he only, he lived on bread and water, which meant that his bones were really brittle and his breath was terrible. They called him a super calloused, fragile mystic, hexed by halitosis. (laughs) I apologize for that one, (laughs) but I couldn't pass it up. Um, we, we elevate those people, right? We don't tend to think of, well, the person who loves God is the one who loves to party, who loves to feast. So when we come to this passage, we've, we've got to understand something about the heart of the host. We've got to understand who God is and how he lays a feast before us. Because Isaiah tells us that God is a party planning host, He has planned this party from of old, plans formed of old, faithful and sure, he says in verse 1. So God is a a party planning God. And in fact, this this idea of God being a party planning God goes, it's all through scripture. So if you miss this, you miss so much of reading the Bible. If you go all the way back to the beginning, you read Genesis 1 and 2, and you read about this God who creates who creates the whole world, and he creates humanity to steward and to enjoy that world. And if you read it, it sounds like a feast. It sounds like preparations for a feast. sounds like a menu, because he says, look, I created all of these fruits, all of these trees, and he says that they're both beautiful and delicious. They're pleasing to the eye, and they're good for food. And he says, eat to his creation, to, his, to, to humanity, Adam and Eve. He says, eat, feast on all of these gifts. And you imagine him saying, come, look at this. Um, look at this mango. You're going to love this. Eat this mango. Try this blood orange. Oh, look, come here. I've got something really good. Try this pomegranate. Isn't it beautiful? It's delicious. Eat it. Feast on it. But then if you know the story, you knew that um, paradise was given as a feast, but paradise was also lost through a meal, through eating the forbidden fruit. But wasn't it the serpent that said, God doesn't really want you to be happy. There's more for you that God is withholding from you. Wasn't that the lie of the enemy? to see God as one who withheld good gifts? Well, if we follow the story, we see that God is continually a God who hosts his people, who feeds his people, and invites them to feast. We see him doing this in the Exodus as he redeems Israel from Egypt, from slavery. He brings them into the wilderness, and he feeds them. And then he brings them up to this mountain at Mount Sinai, and he tells them to come and eat come and eat this peace offering, this peace meal with God. I want to eat with you. And then when he brings them into the Holy Land, he says um, in Deuteronomy, it's one of my favorite uh, verses about this, because it really puts a finer point. He says, go to the place that the Lord your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves. And you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. See, God commands feasting. He commands like 80 days of feasting throughout the year for his people in the Old Testament. He commands these feasts of good foods. And then we know that Jesus came, Luke tells us, Jesus came how? Eating and drinking. And they called him a drunkard and a glutton. 
And even before he died, he tells his disciples, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus was a Messiah who fed the multitudes in the wilderness. And all of his eating and drinking pointed to this passage in Isaiah 25, that on the holy mountain, that is Jerusalem, God would eat with his people. He would feast and he would serve them an extravagant meal. See, eating in the Bible is not a secular activity. It's a sacred activity. It's a liturgical activity. It's an act of thanksgiving, of taking what God has given us and enjoying it to his praise and to worship him. But if you've been reading Isaiah up to this point, I could see where you would get the idea that parties are maybe not so good. Because leading up to chapter 25, Isaiah is prophesying the downfall of all of the other powerful cities in the world. And as he describes their downfall, he even says things like, you know, they're dancing and you hear the sound of music and there will be no more dancing or music in their streets. Or you hear things like, the vines are trampled and, and all of their wine will be gone and they will not drink wine or feast again. So when you get to Isaiah 25, you might think, well, God doesn't really like partying, doesn't like these feasts, because he he's, seems to be um, destroying their feast leading up to this, as he, as he brings down the powerful cities of Isaiah's day. But then you get to Isaiah 25, and that's not the case. Isaiah says in verse 6, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. See, this is his message. Um, when When he gets to Isaiah 25, he says, there's a feast that's coming, and God will host his people, and it'll be better than any party you've ever seen. You can't out-party God. You can't out-party the party-planning, hospitable host who feeds his people the best. It's not that he, he doesn't like parties, so he cancels out all their parties, and then you just get there for worship service in Isaiah 25. No, it's that their parties weren't good enough because they were without him. They were without the host. Isaiah 24 even calls it the wasted city or the meaningless city, the city without form, without the structure of God. But in the city of God, the party is strong. The best food, the best wine is on the table. You can't out-party God. So um, if you're wondering what kind of what that might look like, Um, think of prime tri-tip grilled over red oak with Santa Maria spices. Think of Japanese Wagyu ribeye, some of the most expensive meat that you can buy, one of the most expensive steaks that you can buy. Um, If you're a vegetarian, let's just talk about that later. Um, The shroud will be lifted. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I looked up the most expensive wine in the world. Um, Recently sold for half a million dollars. It's a 1945 Domaine de la Romane Conti Romane Conti Grand Cru. 1945 was an excellent year. Half a million dollars. A hundred thousand dollars per glass for this wine. Um, or maybe you could, you know, if you don't want that, you can, you can go kind of middle shelf for the $9,000 bottle. Um, J.S. Tarantes Madeira from Portugal. This bottle of Madeira was, um, was bottled the year that Thomas Jefferson took the oath for the Oval Office. Um, that's a pretty old wine. Eight, nine thousand dollars a bottle. Now, God has been preparing this 
party for a long time, right? From of old. So he's got a bottle of wine that's thousands of years old that he's ready to open up and to lavish on his people. It's, it's a feast of rich food, of well-aged wine. He says, I'm not, I'm not holding out on my guest. I'm giving him the good stuff. He is an extravagant host. And in fact, um, all of our parties here are meant to be a dress rehearsal of that party. Our worship here and our feast at this table is a dress rehearsal for that day. Um, Our hospitality time after the service is a dress rehearsal for that day. The celebration we do in our community groups is looking forward to that day because one day we will feast with the Lord and he will give us so many good things. He's not going to hold out on us. But there's something even better than, than good wine and meat about this meal. You know, some of the best meals you've had in your life, it, it wasn't just the cost of the meal or um, the quality of the food. It was likely the company, the people that you were with. And, um, and Isaiah points out, who's going to be at this party? And it's a shock that there's an extravagant party, but it's also a shock of who's at the party, Did you see what he said? He he said it a couple of times, actually. He says it's for all nations, for all peoples. All of those cities that he's just destroyed in the chapters leading up, now they're at the feast. They're people from those cities that are at the feast. And it's it's not that he just says, bring the powerful, bring the kings. No, he says, bring the poor, bring the needy. Bring people from every nation to this table. And that's good news for us because in Christ, God breaks down the wall of hostility between nations, between peoples. This is good news for Joseph McNeil, Franklin McCain, Ezel Blair, and David Richmond, the four men who started the Woolworth lunch counter sit-ins in 1960. It was not very long ago when People in this country could not share a meal together because of the hate and bigotry and enmity between races. It's not long ago. And when the Lord returns, every wall will be broken down and he will bring his people, people from every nation, every tongue, every tribe, to sit at his table. He has a long table It's not just for the children of Abraham. It's for all nations, all of those who fear God and who have been united to Christ through faith. It's a multi-ethnic feast. The violence will be over and we'll get to feast and fellowship with one another. But scholars will tell us that there's not just an objective reality in this passage of this multi-ethnic feast that we all are united, there's also a subjective reality in that this feast is not just for all nations or all peoples, but it's for all faces. Isaiah says that um, in, in verse eight, the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. There's a subjective experience, which means that there is a personal experience. So the God that extravagantly lavishes good things, good gifts on his people, he also eagerly welcomes them. He welcomes all people, people from all nations, but he he also eagerly welcomes you, you, your face. There's a personal aspect to this. Paradise was lost, as I said, in a meal, but paradise is regained with a feast as he personally wipes away the tears from our eyes. And we have to see the heart of God in this. We have to see how good this is. It means that that he says, I welcome you to my table. Not just a faceless number, but you. You come to my table and I will wipe away your tears from your face, your particular tears from your particular face. 
You know, sometimes I think um, we see God's hospitality as kind of impersonal. But here's the problem. Good hospitality is never impersonal. It's always personal. It's always, I want you to come to my table and sometimes we think maybe on that day in the, the feast of the Lamb, when Jesus returns and, and brings the new heavens and new earth, maybe I'll just lay low. You know, maybe I'll probably be on the wait staff, or maybe I'll be in the back washing dishes. Um, maybe I can just kind of stay in the, in the margins, um, but I'll still get the benefit, you know, the benefit of being there. But in this passage, Isaiah tells us that at that feast, he will invite you to the table. He will invite you to his table to feast. And you know, one place that I've learned hospitality from, um, the personal nature of hospitality better than anyone else, it's this guy named Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? Won't you be my neighbor? Do you know what he says in the the opening song, this is radical. Don't let his soft uh, spoken voice or the cardigans fool you. Um, he was a, th- this is a fierce war on the darkness. He says, um, I've always wanted a neighbor just like you. Do you believe God says that to you? When he brings you to his table? I've always wanted a son just like you, Russ. I've always wanted a a daughter just like you, Charmaine. I've always wanted a child just like you. Come here and feast. Let me wipe away the tears. See, he is a host that eagerly welcomes his people. We have to see the heart of God in salvation. Our salvation, our election, our adoption, we didn't just win the lottery He didn't just pull a name out of a hat. He desires you. He desires you at his table. You. He created your face. And he wants that face at his table. And on that day, he will wipe away every tear. He will wipe away every tear you've ever shed. And all the tears that you should have shed that you just couldn't get around to. Because this table is not just an extravagant feast. It's not just a, an, an eager welcome from the host that loves so well. This table is also a celebration of the host that entirely defeats our enemies. He says it multiple times. He says that the shroud will be gone. The shroud of death, the curse that ruins in some way every table that you've ever sat at. That shroud will be gone, and death will be swallowed up. He will swallow it up forever. And then there's these weird verses about Moab, like swimming in a dunghill. Um, And you're like, what's that about? God will humble the proud. He will judge the oppressor and the one who exploits. All enemies of his people will be defeated. Sin will be no more. Your desires will be perfected and fulfilled. The violence between peoples will be gone. The enemy, Satan, to accuse, to tell you that you don't belong there, he'll be gone. His voice will not be in your ears. And death will be swallowed up. Death will be gone. There'll be no death forever at this feast And it's because Christ drank the cup of suffering to end death, to swallow it up forever, that we get to come to this feast. And this is a feast of celebration and rejoicing. It is a victory feast. And we will laugh when the tears have been wiped away. And we will rejoice and we will say, behold, this is my God that I've waited for. This is the one I've believed in. He's defeated our enemies and we get to eat with him. He's wiped away all the tears from our eyes, the tears from your father leaving, the tears from your failed marriage, the tears from your chronic pain, your grief, 
your loss, the tears from your abuse, the tears from your unfulfilled longings, they're all wiped away. And there's no more threat. And so you get to eat this meal with satisfaction and joy. No more com- complications to this meal. You get to feast with the great host of the banquet. Every bad thing, everything that has cursed humanity will be gone. Because the lamb has been slain and he has redeemed people from every tribe, nation, and tongue to be his priest, to be his sons and his daughters, and to sit at his table. This meal is the finale of the story that we find ourselves in. Um, Dostoevsky said it this way. He said, I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man, that in the world's finale at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass, that it will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all crimes of humanity, for all the blood that they've shed, that it will make not only possible to forgive, but to justify what has happened. That's what Isaiah is saying this feast is. It's what we're waiting for. But it's not just the finale, is it? It's really only the beginning. It's the beginning of eternity. It's the feast that never ends. It's the feast that lasts forever. And so may we put our eyes on that feast when we're tempted to despair, when we shed tears, when we look around our table and miss those who have gone. May we put our eyes on that feast And may we go out into the world, into the nations, and compel people to come to the feast. Come to a feast that's better than anything you've ever seen before. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Come and feast with him. So may we put our eyes on the host that brings us home, the home that we were intended for. And may we be captivated by the party planning table-setting, death-swallowing, tear-wiping, bottle-popping, meat-grilling, shame-removing host of heaven, the Lord Almighty. May we come to the table not full of ourselves, but hungry and thirsty for righteousness. And may we feast. May we rejoice. And may we hope until he brings us home. Let's pray together. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you are good, you are gracious, and you are hospitable. You want to feed your children with good things. Lord, we thank you for the feast of your word and the feast of your body and blood, of which you will feed us later today. And we pray, Lord, that when we are tempted to despair or doubt, Lord, remind us of these things. Remind us of your goodness and remind us of the home that we will someday be welcomed into. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.